The following Conscious Consumer Network recording of a live broadcast is available to purchase in high definition at ethymarket.com. Support free and independent media by becoming a CCN pledger. For 10 euros a month, you can have unlimited access to CCN high definition downloads at ethymarket.com. Ethymarket, the ethical marketplace for conscious consumers. Welcome to Get Lit at ConsciousConsumerNetwork.tv. Uh, Rebecca Hahn, my co-host, a co-host, is joining me today. And just shortly before we launched, uh, she dipped out of the screen. So at some point, she will re-enter. But we're really excited about the show today. Uh, we have guests uh, Julian Robles and Justin Deschamp from Stillness in the Storm. And what happened for me is not very long ago, I'm going to read you the title. I came across their recent article and the title was, is self-mastery and discernment are essential to avoid AI enslavement. Biotechnology hybrids open the door to extraterrestrials, AI robots replacing humanity. And when I read this article, I got way jazzed about the opportunity to have a conversation about how we're looking at, how we're discerning. Uh, well, actually the theme of Get Lit today is discernment, love, and investigative reporting. And how to begin to listen to knowledge and research and really uh, gain the knowledge, but refrain from having a dualistic perspective once you've acquired that information. So uh, what I'm going to do is right now, I'd like for uh, Julian and Justin to just take the opportunity to introduce yourselves and share whatever it is you'd like uh, in preparation for our show. Welcome. <clears throat> Alrighty. Well, thank you for having us on. Uh, we are also extremely excited to be here. And I think we could both agree that you definitely chose a really good article to talk about. Yes. Lots of stuff in there. Um, and key things uh, definitely are, are in there. Um, <clears throat> our blog, my name is Julian Robles. And I'm Justin Deschamps. <laughs> and um, you can find our, that article that you're talking about is uh, on our blog, which is stillnessinthestorm.com. Um, yeah, um, well, I'll just give a brief uh, introduction to that article. We've been following um, the work of a secret space program insider named Corey Good um, since about February or March of this year. And um, it's something that Julian and I really <clears throat> felt like we could speak to because it, it, the work that he describes and he shares incorporates a huge amount of topics. And he was discussing various philosophies and uh, events that relate to AI technology, nanotechnology, who the power control system is, what activities we're having in space. And it was a really good opportunity for us to bring uh, many different topics to the table and have a discussion. So um, that's where that kind of that post was inspired from. And, and for those who haven't been following the work we've been doing on the blog, we we don't really have any bias towards anybody in the sense that we think one person is always speaking truth and then somebody else is always telling lies. Our perspective is kind of that everything, all that is, 
has value and is absolute data that we can use for our own personal process of understanding and discerning what is and what the truth really is. So um, we used those topics to discuss that big overarching idea in the post. Right. It also so happens that, you know, a lot of the philosophical things that um, Corey Good has been talking about in relation to the law of one and, and the, the philosophical aspect of his updates, <clears throat> we had also been talking about on our blog since inception. Um, you know, if you go back to the very beginning, quote unquote, of the blog, you'll see that there's things there talking about the law of one and how um, keeping that understanding in mind uh, can really help you grow. Right. <clears throat> Well, I think one of the things that I've been noticing, especially in the social network, is there is so much information coming in right now that we're, we're really, we're on like this roller coaster. It's like, you know, one moment this great reporting comes in and it says, you know, this is absolutely true. We've got evidence, da 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 da, da. And, you know, in less than 24 hours, the next article comes in and says, oh, no, 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 that's not true. And and I feel like we're we're like a ping pong ball, you know, we've been getting hit back and forth. And when I sat back and really observed that, I realized there's something really wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. That we need a lot more spaciousness in hearing the facts and discerning from within ourselves. But my question is, how could we how can we refrain from sitting in a dualistic position? How, you know, like what's the healing, what's the insight, what's the direction can we take uh, to put us in that neutral zone and weigh it all out? Right. Well, that's a great question. I think the answer to that question is answered by, analyzing or discussing what the truth actually is. So, you know, for people in the awakening community, we, we feel like we understand what the truth is, or at least we're starting to understand. So uh, one of the things that Julian and I spend a lot of time talking about is the, the process for discovering what the truth is. So on the, on the one hand, we have representations of truth, and then we have the truth itself. So let me give you some examples behind that. So if I, if I make the statement that right now it is a cloudy day wherever you are, well, that is a statement of truth. It's not that in that statement there's actual clouds. It's just word symbols that you can decode in your mind and it yields a meaning. And the meaning in this case is the sky is cloudy. Okay, well, that's just a representation. <clears throat> Now you, as the person who's received that, have to actually turn around and look to see, well, is it really cloudy out or not? And that's where the discernment process comes in. So what we have happening right now, especially in the awakening community, is we've got a lot of pronouncements of truth. And what ten, people tend to do is they focus on just the pronouncement, just the statement. And they don't actually go and look in their experience, either inside of themselves or depending on what we're talking about, to see if that actually resonates or if it actually reflects the truth. So in, our, in my perspective, I think the middle path and not getting bounced around so much is realizing that everybody's statements, whether it's from the government, whether it's from you know, a spiritual guru, whether it's from a channeled entity, whether it's uh, your higher self, all of those are just representations of truth. And in order for it to really have any kind of bearing on yourself, in order for it to actually impart you with empowerment, you've got to take that statement and think about it and internalize it. And at that point, it be, it's like a book in your library. You can always go back to it and pull from it and, and compare it to another book to see how these two books relate to each other. You know, And in that way, it, we don't have to put all of our beliefs in one person or one idea because we're looking at everything to try to figure out what is really happening. What is the truth? That was really well said. I so appreciate that clarity. And what's going through my mind is 
you know, one of my uh, streams is always looking at how do we embrace diversity? And behind that is freedom. And freedom to me is the ability to be the changeable selves that we are. And in our personal process, we're filled with contradictions. And contradictions has gotten a bad rap in the past. And I'm looking at it now and going, no, 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 no. Contradictions is something to be celebrated. Yes. Because today, just like what you described, a pronouncement may come across my screen. And today I discern it's this way. And then tomorrow, because I'm a changeable agent, I, I switch and, and, and now I'm in a contradiction or you could say a contradiction. And I think that we are starting to come on the edge of really needing to clarify what is freedom and what does real diversity mean? Because I think we're all wanting that diversity. And it's just like the information that is being delivered right now. It's like, how do you be in the presence of a diverse person? How do you be in the presence of a diverse opinion and not immediately separate and compartmentalize? Right. <clears throat> well, uh, I feel like that wanting to separate and compartmentalize is, um, is the beginning process of being in that duality. Um, if we, if we look at our existence, if you will, um, and we're searching for what the truth is, that, you know, what is the truth is kind of a, a heavy question, if you will. There's a lot that can be said about what is the truth. So depending on what we're talking about, what foundation we're, we're coming from, if we're able to continuously within ourselves realize the truth of, for instance, the law of one being, that we are all one, that everything is love, and that in the end, there's no death, and in the end, there's no mm, evil, if you will. So <clears throat> if we can keep that in mind, everything that is, that is not the love and that is not the unity is some sort of uh, distortion or some sort of um, shadow of the truth. So if we can keep that in mind, then when we see the shadows and when we see the distortions, we can realize there's something there that that person is going through um, that is confusing them or that they haven't figured out just yet. Because had they figured this out, they wouldn't feel the need to express themselves in that way. Right. I love that. And I feel like, uh, Julian, what you're now introducing is, and it's a significant part of what we're, addressing is we're always going to spiral back to our spiritual nature, you know, the unseeable and what we, you know, seem to consensually attach to the understanding of love. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pause for a moment and welcome Becca back. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And okay. okay. Stop me. Good. Hi everyone. So, <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. yeah. And how to summarize this, I think uh, what we've already, we're addressing is uh, we're looking at discernment, we're looking at diversity. Um, how, the, I would say that the question led off with how can we find that neutral position in the face of diversity of people and opinion and not choose a dualistic position? And uh, Julian was just really commenting on how, in my assessment, is when we come back to our spiritual nature, that part of us that observes, uh, that's going to be an independent individual selection. I don't know if I summarize that the way you would say, Julian. Julian and Justin, would you like to add a summary to just catch Becca up for a moment? Sure. Go ahead. Um... Well, I'll just kind of expand on what Julian was saying in my own words. Uh, you know, when we talk about diversity, diversity is really at the core of our beingness. Because, you know, if we, we think about 
to 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 bring in the idea of the creator if the creator exists there's only one creator in the primal reality so before where we are now there was just complete absolute oneness there was no differentiation and then the creator through some process decided to create an illusion of individuation so now we have the same creator it's still there but now there's manyness infiniteness and really the best way i think to to kind of make this a personal understanding is imagine that you've got a big group of people watching some events like uh i don't know a shamanic dance for example and um and they, they have people in the audience but and every person has their own unique point of view on the same event the same singular event so in a way, really, if we boil down who, what our essence, our connection to all that is, is we are really a point of view, that observational point of view on everything, including our physical bodies, including our thoughts, including our knowledge. All of that is all something that we're observing. And it's not that my point of view is better than yours. It's, all, it's unified with every other point of view. So if we take this to a human kind of a, a, a thought process, my experience that I have is based on, you know, where I grew up, who my parents were, what I was taught, all these things. And all of those experiences are coming in and informing me and giving me an enhanced perspective, which is totally my own. But we're all looking at the same thing. It, so everybody's got a unique point of view with their own unique knowledge to kind of bring it forth out. And when we incorporate that diversity into everything, then it, it, we're not just holding on to one person's belief or one person's conclusion. Now we get to add all the pieces together and come to a very diverse, clear picture, the more, more points of view that we bring into focus. Yeah, and if, if I may also, <clears throat> what people are experiencing as, um, their truth is very real to that person and the only way that you know if let's say that something is not true that they're experiencing in our perspective uh the only way that anything can change about uh any discrepancies if you will uh, is to first accept what is already happening how the person sees it and then to move on you know you 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 what is the word i'm looking for <laughs> i don't know <laughs> you address the emotional side of what's going on um you know make it because to them it's to us which happens to me as well it's very real at that time and until you can accept that realness in that moment um that's the only time you're going to be able to move forward and and see if there was something that maybe you made a mistake in your observation or your perception and you got you know, upset, or maybe you interpreted something you read as incorrectly because you were, you had a veil of emotional charge or bias that's going on. Yeah, there's so much I could say about that. One of our, one of our themes is um, how to refine being your own observer and where to kind of clear, get clear, get clean. And so you can really track using your own eye tech basically what is actually my experience in this human form and what's my experience in the divine form. Mm -hmm. But it brings back that old saying, I don't know if you've heard it, I don't experience the world as it is, I experience the world as I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about diversity or inner diversity, creating that space within yourself, primarily number one, we can't have outer diversity <laughs> and accept all the viewpoints and beliefs of others if we can't accept our own. So it comes back to that idea of, really owning all parts of ourselves and accepting those so that when we come across that football stadium full of other aspects that we have enough spaciousness in ourselves to not only observe what is happening in a neutral way but also to be able to love all parts of ourselves that react and use that as information as opposed to reaction so but it takes, it's, it's, it, there's finesse to, and a, a practice of becoming an observer to the point where you can say, right now this body, this self is experiencing rage or jealousy or insecurity around something that you are doing. I'd like to speak to that and not have it be 
so encompassing that you can't use it as information. But I love the points you're making in mm. terms of this idea of diversity and how it, it goes to this idea of a lot of the stuff I've read that you guys have put out around um, being able to discerning. And if we're engulfed in our own emotions and our own subjectivity, how can we possibly become discerning around everything? Because there may be a kernel of truth in something that's a very oppositional viewpoint or belief. And if we're so clouded with our own emotionality, how are we ever going to be able to research and be discerning to gather from the places that are really essentially important to transform? So I love what you all were saying about diversity on so many levels. Okay, and so with that being said, I'd like to create a bridge to, um, and I wanna hear from each of you in the understanding of investigative reporting. And there's a certain ethics protocol that I think we're redesigning in this day and age, but the bridge to what is good investigative reporting? And I guess equally, what is a good listener? What's a good receiver of investigative reporting? Right. Because um, what I'm hoping, uh, uh, just to clarify that one more, is like what I'm hoping is those who are listening and joining us in this conversation, that we kind of uh, bring it up a few notches in our personal responsibility as receivers. Right. Well, um, I think that our practice of investigative reporting is trying to be objective as much as possible. So what that simply means is that we're, we're, not, we're trying to gather as much of the observational data as we can and put that out there first, or at least make sure that that's in a complete enough form so that somebody who's receiving this information can have the, the, the tools they need, the raw data, to make their own conclusion and their own decision. Um, which is difficult because at the same time, I also have my own subjective experience. So it's kind of like a, what, what I would term a divine dichotomy. On the one hand, I want to share absolute truth, but on the other hand, it's impossible to share absolute truth without passing it through my own filter. <laughs> so, um, what we try to do a lot of times is we'll, we'll boil down information to the points that we think it means. And then we'll offer our opinion or our conclusion of what that we think is being said. And it's not in a, you need to believe this because this is what is the truth. It's more of a topic of discussion, just like we're having here. You know, um, did you want to add anything? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I would say for us, investigative reporting, I guess, uh, it's more so about trying to understand the facts, if you the facts or what has actually taken place, what has happened. Because normally what we're talking about is some sort of an event. So something happened, something took place, and then we're trying to discern, well, what is it, what really happened? What does it mean? And why did it happen usually? Um, so that's basically, I feel like what we try to do, we try to, instead of um, focusing on how we feel about it or how, or uh, the emotional charge behind, for instance, uh, recently the Tianjin um, explosion that people aren't exactly sure how that happened. You know, that's a perfect example. Uh, we don't know for sure exact, we know that something happened. We know that there was an explosion. We know that there's a reason. We know um, that people were involved, but we don't know for sure with, without a doubt exactly what happened. So we have to go with a certain, um, what is the term that you use? Uh, you only have so much certainty. You know? Oh, right. We have limited or uh, operational certainty. So I mean, here, I'll just get into this real, real quick. <laughs> so... So basically, uh, my, my background, for those who don't know, I, I studied physics and psychology and science for most of my life. And it was a really good experience because it taught me the, the kind of the scientific method of observing something and then making a, d discerning what the meaning of what you just observed is. Now in science, there's this idea called certainty, which means that whatever the meaning that you've pulled out of your observation, 
Well, you can't be 100% absolutely certain. There's always going to be a little bit of error or doubt. And where that error comes from is the quality or the consistency of the knowledge that supports whatever you're saying. So in this situation, we have, uh, I'll use the, the Tianjin explosion as an example. We have the raw facts that uh, the media definitely reported that there was an explosion. Then we have other information like YouTube videos and eyewitness accounts. So all of these are facts that we can put on the table. And once we filled the, the table with all these different pieces of data, now we can really begin the process of trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? Okay, so then we may say, well, this means that the, the explosion was most likely a warehouse fire because that's what the media is saying. Okay, so now we've got this, this meaning. Now we can go back and it's like a feedback cycle. Now we can go back and look at the evidence again and say, well, is there any evidence to support this meaning? And all of that is gonna come to a, a, a answer of certainty. Is it gonna be less likely? Is it gonna be more likely? And what's the evidence to support that? And when we try to think of things and information in that way, we're not placing anything in absolutes, which is in, in a really psychological definition, anything that's an absolute is by definition a dualistic thing. It's either this or it's either that. There's no middle ground. You see, so when you step outside of that and you kind of walk the middle path of likelihood and unlikelihood, certainty and certainty, well, you, you know, all of your conclusions are all based on the evidence you have to work with. And tomorrow, there may be more facts to put on the table, which means, guess what? You get to reevaluate your conclusions and come up with a better understanding. So in this way, we're not emotionally invested in what we think is happening because we're always open-minded to something else. Okay, so then you just pretty much described as an investigative reporter, those certainty and uncertainty, the description of absolute, of the same experience the receiver goes through. Right. Right. Because <laughs> there, there you are, right? Okay, so it's happening on both sides of the fence. So now I want to, I really want to examine, I don't think we have a very good a model for being receivers. And I think it is going to take us into our emotional spiritual base. So we're going to have to be able to identify like what Becky, you just mentioned a few moments ago, when we're reacting to the reporting or when we're responding or even going further, when we're taking the information and we're evolving it. Right. So if we could speak a little bit to, What's the responsibility of the viewer? How's, how does that break down when, you know, they're taking in the information? Sure. Well, I mean, the, we're, first I'll just set the record straight. We're, we're reviewers too, we're receivers too. <laughs> so we're, we're at the same level of somebody reading our blog, wanting to know what's happening. We're also doing that for everybody else, including our own work. So, um, and I think really what, where, where it can get tricky is what we have is a dynamic between the past and the future, which is being coming into the now. Anytime we review information, the past, our choices and beliefs that we've, we've had about something are gonna kinda come to the surface. So, Let's take an example like 9-11. You know, if we have not done any kind of research whatsoever, all we have to work with is what our, pre our pre-existing knowledge tells us, which is that 9-11 was 19 hijackers and it was a terrorist event and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so now when we encounter an article or somebody's telling us their perspective that they think 9-11 was an inside job and it was actually the government working to affect some type of false flag situation. Well, that, as you were mentioning earlier, that's gonna create a contradiction inside of us because now our past belief is being, is, is being not attacked, but uh, highlighted with this new information. And now there's, there's some differences there that we've got to sort out. We've got to make sense of something here, okay? And, and what usually happens is somebody in, in a receiver's capacity when you're reviewing information is, 
all of your pre-existing beliefs are going to come to the surface and anything that doesn't agree with your pre-existing beliefs is going to feel not good. You know, it's going to feel unsettling. It's going to feel like, well, wait a minute, maybe I didn't have all the facts straight before. And that, and that reflects internally on ourselves. Like, well, maybe I wasn't good enough to, or maybe what I thought was true before isn't true. And now I have to rethink everything, which is an unsettling experience. In a way, I mean, we could really get deep with it from a psychological level. When we are encountering new information, there is a birth process that's about to happen. So, so what this is the key sorry. word, a key word that you brought up is it seems like we need to uh, go deep, more deeply into contradiction. And yeah. not see contradiction as a negative thing, but as a very, uh, it's a reality check. We are filled with contradictions. Now we've got to love that. But I'm sorry, I, I, I did jump in there. Oh, no, no problem. Um, no, that's a great point. And really, when we talk about discernment, I think contradiction is a huge tool on your belt to help you because because when you're analyzing information or you're reviewing information, whatever you think about the information is going to come bubbling up inside your mind. So, and anything that is being presented to you, if there's a conflict there, well, now there's an opportunity to really get more understanding and enhance your own knowledge. So, to use the 9-11 example from before, if you, know, if you were somebody that believes the official story, you accept that as your truth. Well, now you're emotionally invested in it. For literally, it's a part of your identity. It is your worldview. Okay, so now, if you're somebody who's open-minded and you're open to the truth, if you're on that path, well, you're, ha you're gonna have a more of a tendency to actually want to know, well, what do you mean that 9-11 was an inside job? Let, tell me more, I want to understand. Even okay. if it sounds crazy, you wanna know the truth. Exactly. Because you want to know the truth, ultimately. That's somebody who's a truth seeker. Now, on the other side of the coin, we have somebody who's closed-minded. You know? And the reason they're closed-minded is because they're emotionally invested in their beliefs to the point where they're trying to protect their reality bubble, literally. I mean, you know, I've had this experience before. Julian and I are, were in a group setting, having a conversation about things, and somebody will say, Listen, I can't hear about these ideas you're talking about because this is bursting my reality bubble, basically. Right. I can't. There's no way that I could accept that the government would even allow such a thing, right. for instance. Exactly. So when, when you're at that level, when you're not choosing truth, the other side of the coin is choosing ignorance. You're literally choosing to limit your knowledge, limit understanding, and to protect your reality bubble, basically, how you perceive the world. And, um, and that can be difficult for a lot of people to get through because the process of pulling back the veil and realizing that you may have been duped or you may have, the conclusions you drew in the past may be inaccurate is hard to, to process for a lot of people. And I would argue it's because of the conditioning we're, we're, we're on earth to exactly. dealing with. I mean, we're, we're in a situation where it's socially unacceptable to question official stories to the point where you're ridiculed, ousted, and completely villainized in society. So when you begin to walk this path of truth, it's interesting because internally you're growing, you're expanding, you're becoming self-empowered, but externally you're becoming more separate from the, the devout followers of <laughs> the external knowledge or uh, the devout followers of officialdom. So, uh, so yeah. So I would love to speak to a couple of your points, if I may. Please. Um, I love, you know, that you pointed out you're you're choosing either ignorance or you're truth choosing truth. And I think to add something that would be you're either choosing ignorance or you're choosing to be a truth seeker, right. because I think we almost set ourselves up by leaving it just at truth, because then you're constantly wanting some sort of ultimate truth in something and as we've been discussing truth as we go deeper changes and shifts along the way and as we gain more knowledge we gain more discernment and the truth that we have today may not be the truth that we have tomorrow but 
you know, this idea of becoming so discerning and, and being in the practice of being a truth seeker, um, you know, if you use 9-11 as the example, most people had really strong reactions to what that story was all about. And um, very emotional about it as well. And so if we look at that, we can see in people their daily practice, just in terms of their reactions to their beliefs around 9-11 and what they're holding on to for self-preservation. Um, because if they allow themselves to be truth seekers, then they're allowing themselves to have to let go of their worldview, their beliefs, their cultural perspectives, their religion, whatever it may be in them. And as you said, that's this, this a huge point of chaos and um, kind of being disoriented. And if we look at it from that psychological point of view, there is a rebirth that happens when that is. There's a, there's a letting go. And, and if we want to speak of a conscious death, killing off those things that are beliefs that were part of our orientation, both emotionally, physically, sexually, relationally. And so Evan was a great example of how as a populace, people typically reacted because we are not in the practice of being truth seekers. We're not in the practice of sitting in our own chaos, practicing our own conscious death of those things that no longer serve us or that the story may be different than we thought. And so I take it back to this idea of, um, you know, every day practicing a little bit of a conscious death, a little bit of sitting in chaos. So that when you come across even something so minuscule as, um, you know, your partner does something and you both have a very different reaction or emotional body reaction to that, to go, yeah, there's no right or wrong. This is the gray area. You know, to live in the gray area and discern the subtle moments of each thing and go, great, I honor that and you can honor this and tomorrow we'll wake up and we'll gain more knowledge around it and we'll continue to seek the truth of what is actually happening. But it really speaks to this idea that we don't know how to sit in our own chaos or in our own disorientation to be able to let go of those things. Um, and to this day, people are still holding fast, if we look at 9-11, to this idea of what it was supposed to be and everyone else's idea as a conspiracy theory. Because people can't even pull knowledge from different places and <clears throat> use it to reorient their own systems. And so it goes back to this idea of also being so <clears throat> attached to immediate gratification. Okay, this fits, this fits, it seems to fit, makes me feel comfortable, I'm gonna stay with that. Right. Um, and so, you know, even this idea of the, you know, when I observe people in group dynamics that everyone is so desperate and almost panicking to get their ideas out because ah, then I feel better because my idea is on the table and that's the truth and it's now I'm oriented again. So to take, you know, where, how do we get there? How do we get to a place of being able to sit in our own chaos, be the recipient and the receiver of information in a way where if it, <coughs> orients us, we can still sit with that and that we don't feel like we have to puke everything back out right away. And we can really sit and, and being completely open and spacious in ourselves to hear what you are saying or you are saying, and then find pieces how that fits to reorient ourselves to a greater truth. Because who knows what ultimate truth is? Are we ever going to find it? I don't know if that's necessarily the goal. It's that we constantly are on a path of reorienting towards something more pure. But how do we do that if we're gucked up? How do we do that if we can't even sit with our own chaos enough to rebirth a new orientation? So I love the example of 9-11 because it's such a global example. Right. But if we look at it, people panic and people had opinions that they puked out on each other and everybody's wrong and I'm right. And so, you know, we're talking from this place of being a very learning researcher and, um, and, and fact finder. But if we take back several steps, like how do we even get to the place in ourselves where we can start practicing that? So if something does come up where we have to be discerning outside of ourselves, how do we manage that? Right? What's our well, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's what I wanted to share. I wanted to share a story that happened to me the other day. And uh, before uh, we got uh, cut off, I was saying that I'm starting to hear a sign. 
I'm starting to hear like there's a trying because I really want to give equal time to source, you know, who, however we identify that observer in ourselves, our spiritual nature, our love center, okay? So I'm hearing this trying. Maybe it's duality, okay? There's the two opposing sides and then there's source. And so this is what happened to me the other day. I was sitting with uh, another uh, a journalist who writes uh, for a living, investigative reporter, and uh, very knowledgeable, and she was clearly stating to me that uh, she was doing an article on uh, the contamination of pharmaceuticals, okay? Now, in our world, we know the extent, and we seem to share uh, background in the research that's been done in that. However, she shared with me that her perspective is that all the contamination that's happening, all right, is inadvertent. Now, as many of you know, I don't sit here and hold that position. I don't, I don't believe anymore that things are inadvertent. And I think that now it's a, it's a really healthy attitude to re-explore conspiracy theories. All right. And I sat there and I went, wow, it was just clearly stated. That's how she's going down the rabbit hole. That's how I'm not going down the rabbit hole. And I, I was so aware of where do I go with this in this moment? And I just breathed and I felt this kind of almost like a knot in my belly. And then I breathed through that and I just said, let it go. Let it go. Don't go and find and continue the conversation knowing we're from two different ends of the world right now. And that to me, um, the reason I'm sharing it is I think that's a kernel of some of the experiences we may begin to have when we choose not to be in a dualistic position, be attached to any perspective we have. It was like, I just came back. I was enjoying her company. I was enjoying conversation. I came back to love, to just my presence being with her presence. So I, I just wanted to kind of reintegrate. Br let's bring that love and observe herself into this conversation. Sure. Um, well, love is a great topic to, to bring into this because really I feel like discernment begins with love. And I, what I mean by that is let, let's compare what the two base emotions are. We have love and we have fear. So what does love do to us? It opens us up. We literally become receivers. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you're in love, your eyes are open. You're willing to, to receive the data you're, you're coming in contact with. If you're in fear, it's the opposite. You're trying to close your eyes. You're trying to protect yourself from something. So when we talk about discerning something, discernment, what the term discernment actually means is taking information and understanding how it comes in together, how it actually fits. You know, if, uh, if I take a match and I run it across a matchbook, the sandy paper, why is the matchbook actually causing it to ignite? There's things that are happening there. There's all these little data points that if I'm willing to observe and, and love be in that space of acceptance, now I can have all the pieces that I can really start to come to an understanding of what, what is happening, you know? And if we apply that to really any, any experience you can think of, you're always going to have that choice of love or fear. And when we're in fear, it's usually, in my experience, it's because we're trying to protect something inside of us that we think should be happening. Whether it's an expectation, you know, uh, you had a meeting with a friend and they said they were going to be there at six o'clock and they, they ended up showing up at 630 and because in your mind you're expecting them to show up, you're getting yourself all worked up and angry. And then when they finally come in, you're like, you know, what the hell? I've been sitting here for a half hour and you get really frustrated. Well, are you, in, are you in love or fear at that point? Because you haven't received any information. Maybe your friend had an accident. Maybe there was some massive revelation in their life and they needed that extra half hour to come into a more complete aspect of their beingness. So it, when we make that choice to be in love, we're making the choice to be the observer, in my opinion. We're making the choice to actually connect with all that is. And 
around us, there's, there's pieces of all that is that are kind of streaming into us. And what we've kind of been trained to do on earth is just pick and choose the ones that we want for ourselves and just throw everything else out the window. And what that, what that means is that when you walk a path of ignorance, now instead of embracing reality and, and being loving everything and loving what is, well, now you have to defend yourself from reality, which means if somebody tells you something that doesn't resonate with you, well, now, not only do you not believe it, but now you have to make it a point to tell them that they're wrong and you don't believe it. And it creates this division, this polarization. <laughs> so, um, so I feel like love is, is really the foundation of everything because it opens us up at so many different levels. Uh, yeah, one thing I'd like to add is that, you know, if we, um, if we really do have the concept of the law of one or that everything is love, or that everything is interconnected, if we really do carry on that um, realization with us and we step out of the duality, which is the love and the fear, you know, the polar opposites, in reality, it's just a, they're, they're the same thing in varying degrees. You know, when somebody's in extreme fear, it's usually because they're in extreme love for something else. As funny as that sounds. So, you know, if somebody's about to be, you know, somebody's pointing a gun at somebody and they're in extreme fear because they love themselves, for instance, or they love someone in their life. So if we can try to, to and, and it's a process, it's not, you know, I'm not sitting here as a guru stating that this is how I operate all the time because it happens to me all the time. I'll be the first, I'll be the first one to admit I forget. I don't have that realization at times. But then when I don't, I try to look back and say, okay, I definitely, you know, forgot in that moment. And I was more focused on the victimization or the fear aspect of the situation there. And, and I can definitely, you know, try to uh, fix that or make a new choice, may, make it so that it's more reflective of what I really understand and not so much what I was afraid of. Um, one, Rebecca, oh, go ahead. One thing that reminded me of is we, um, on one of our broadcasts, we were talking, I was making this sort of um, kind of discovery around judgment and how it's part of our primitive brain stem in the sense that, that there was a time when judging harshly and quickly was our survival. You know, is the dinosaur going to eat me? Is it not? And we don't really need judgment anymore in those terms, life or death, but we have these triggers that lead us to harsh, quick judgment. And it's almost like I, I described it for myself. And as you said, you know, sometimes it just gets the best of me. And I later say, I knew better. I could have, should have. And I just had to do it because I couldn't help myself. Mm -hmm. And I notice that when I'm too tired, too hungry, too afraid, or I want something passionately or I care for something passionately or I love something passionately that the opposite for me is harsh judgment um which is very narrow and I try and control everything in a way where I'm judging everything very harshly and it becomes this like feeding frenzy in a way where it's like no this is my this is my belief and this is right and you're wrong and why are you doing it that way and this is what I need and you should do it this way because this is what I need to feel loved and I need to feel safe and I looked at that one day and I went, I judge harshly and quickly when I'm in a place of fear and I'm in a place of fear when I want something so much or I'm vulnerable in my own love and nakedness in my own soul. And I found correlation just incredibly fascinating between the primitive brainstem and this primitive need, this feeding frenzy I need to do around judgment and how when I get done with my blah, judgment thing, I go, oh my gosh, that felt so good. I feel full now. I feel safe. I feel satisfied. And so, and I think it's part of that primitive survival mechanism within us that we, we need to judge something in order to feel safe. You know, is this person going to eat me and kill me or are they going to love me and make me feel safe? Is it the dinosaur or is it the, the, the thing that's going to nurture me? And so when I made that correlation, it was really fascinating for me because it, it also goes back to this idea of um, having an inner diversity and space within ourselves to 
love all parts of ourselves. And we can only do that if we can be our own observer and go, yeah, that part of yourself is really ridiculous, but I love it anyway, and I love you anyway. And that part of you is really ridiculous, but I love that anyway, and I love you anyway. And it's not going to kill me or eat me. It's a different perspective that can inform me. And then we bring it to the next level of, if we're doing investigative reporting, it's not shutting down the gate or judging harshly. Oh, that's just, you know, that's just bull. And that's, it's not my belief system, so it's wrong. And I'm going to shut the book or the newspaper or the podcast on this thing because it's not my belief system. Instead, keep yourself open and spacious in a place of love. So it's almost like technical love, like this place of being discerning with compassion and just curious, like neutrally curious and seeing where it sits in you. But I, for me personally, I've increased my level of being my own observer around judgment because judgment to me is that place of fear. I'm fixing fear by judging harshly and I get very narrow and lack spaciousness for love of myself or you. So just that's my thoughts on tying in kind of what you were talking towards. Yeah, I, I really appreciate um, I appreciate the way you presented that, Rebecca. And it is okay. So that that's our emotional psychological aspects. It's the that part of us that's self reflecting. Now I want to jump to uh, another place for a moment. I have recently been. Uh, I just finished this book. It's Brave New World and Brave New World Revisited. Aldous Huxley phenomenal book. And Huxley speaks very uh, eloquently to not only did he predict a lot of the, of the um, state of affairs that we're in today, but he had some um, suggestions on, you know, what are we going to do when total, total, totalitarianism and dictatorship start to become more prominent in our world? Uh, under the uh, disguise of democracy. And he names four things. He says that, first of all, we need re-education. And the re-education would have to include the categories of what he calls morality and values, propaganda, and I'm going to go into that in a moment. This is fascinating to me. Stabilization and freedom. Now, I'm going to jump right to propaganda because I thought this was fascinating. He's basically saying that <clears throat> propaganda is almost necessary in uh, organization of society <clears throat> because propaganda actually serves us in uh, selling products, for instance, you know, attaching symbols to products, meanings to symbols, uh, which he's suggesting um, support stabilization in a government so that you have some sense of organization. However, he also says you have to include the education of propaganda so that we as individuals, as free individuals, have all the information so that we can discern when we are supportive of the propaganda or not. And I thought that was just a really interesting um, uh, point to bring forth. And then he talks about freedom. Now, everything, he's basically saying that a government or a community, in order to be organized, requires a certain stabilization. And therefore, you have to educate people on freedom. And what is recognized is if we are in our total freedom, there wouldn't be any way to manage us. So you have to educate freedom so that you have your freedom, like let's say what we thought was appropriate within an honored democratic system. You know, like the United States, we had a certain amount of freedom. Now it's getting just, you know, chipped away more and more. However, he's saying that you don't want to take away the diversity of the individual, but if you have too much freedom, you have chaos. But again, it's with everybody's informed and you have that understanding together. And along with that, he's saying that suggestibility is an acceptable standard in 
an organized government, however it's got to be, you know, and that's the complete opposite of what we have. It's got to be uh, with all people knowledgeable that we are, in fact, using suggestibility and you still have the freedom uh, to respond to that suggestibility or agree or disagree. Like, for instance, let's say we all agreed cannabis was a good uh, suggestibility for medicinal purposes. And, uh, and we accepted that as part of our government. Anyway, I wanted to just take a turn to this because um, it feels like we now in this conversation, it's like we want to talk about how do we educate ourselves and especially about freedom and how do we educate ourselves about duality as a significant role player in how uh, information investigative reporting is being offered to us. So I hope I didn't go too out there, but if anyone has some response to any aspect of that. Quickly, Blue, I would like to, mm -hmm. I'm feeling this impulse to do a little role play thing with you around this. Okay. Quickly, because, you know, <laughs> We're throwing out words like freedom and suggestibility and propaganda. And, you know, basically what he's describing is a utopia of awake people, which we are not yet. But, you know, what would that look like? Like, let's, for instance, take, um, okay, so if you want to play the role of the person who either is uneducated or has an opposing belief around um, cannabis being something that should be legalized for medical purposes. So, okay. you know, how would I start that? Would I say, Blue, do I have permission to suggest some information to you? You know, is that how yeah. it would sound? You know, like, do I have permission to suggest? Are you in a place right now where I may suggest something to you that's new to your belief system? Okay. And so in this moment, I'd say, yeah, I'm open to suggestibility, a suggestion. Okay, so it is my understanding that you are not in agreement with cannabis being legalized for medical use, but I've done some research and here's something I have found. I have found A, I found B, I found C, and I found D. Do you think you could be open to taking that information and then sitting with it? How are you feeling about that information? Well, my first response is, you know, I have some opinions about people who are doing medicinal cannabis. You know, sometimes I feel like maybe they won't be as present to what they need to do for themselves. I don't know. It's just a thought I'm having. Okay. Um, and, you know, will people get, you know, will they get less active in responsibility? Okay. So what I'm hearing you saying is that you have this belief system or this viewpoint in your head that if it becomes legalized, people might not be as aware or present or they might uh, not be as motivated. They might take advantage of it. Is this what I'm hearing? Yeah, something like that. Okay. So here's the information and I, you know, I'm handing it to you. Would you be open to taking a look at that and we can revisit the conversation in a couple of days? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, cut. Okay. Some summary. So, you know, in an awake world where everybody's aware and awake, you know, we, we ask permission, are you in the right headspace? Take this and digest it. And then you have this ability to take the propaganda or the truth seeking, the facts that are on the table. And then you get to discern what they are and feel what that feels like for yourself. And again, instead of puking something right back out again, you're taking time to digest that. And then right. B, you as a free will person, you still know you have the right to do whatever you want with it, but that you're not so engulfed in it that it takes you on a course that you have no control over. So 
I don't know. I just wanted to point out to maybe the viewers, like what, like, let's play with that. What would that look like? Cause we talk around a lot about the utopia of what that may be at some point and it's time consuming and it's subtle and it's very, you know, it, there's a lot of active listening. It's much more exhausting. than just being like, eh, whatever, you know? So I just yeah. want to play with that for a minute. Okay. I'm done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a great role play. Um, well, uh, okay, so we're talking about the role of uh, was it propaganda? Is that what we were gonna we were discussing? Okay. Well, I, I think the the foundation behind the four things that he mentioned is knowledge and ignorance. So, why do we need legal codes? and police officers? Why do we need the EPA and regulation agencies to tell us what is right and wrong? Well, it's because we don't know ourselves, right? And in our world, there's so much distraction that it's really impossible to try to come to a personal understanding of a diverse topic without sacrificing something else in your life. You know, and really that, you know, there, I wouldn't say that there's real money in the sense of Federal Reserve notes, but there is real money or one eye in the sense of time. What we spend our time on is literally what's going to come inside of us and enhance us and give us the tools we need. So in our world today, we have the proliferation of ignorance. Oh, don't worry about, you don't have to learn science. You don't have to learn medicine. We're going to do that for you. We're the medical industry. You know, you don't have to learn whether or not um, right and wrong and what morality is. That's what we got the legal system for. Just go and watch a movie or something, you know? And that's, that's kind of the way our society is shaped. So it literally fosters ignorance. And when you have pandemic ignorance, even in just a, an everyday situation, if you don't know how to cook dinner for yourself, well, somebody else has to do it for you, don't they? And that's what happens. We have, anytime you have ignorance, you have dependency. So in a utopic world, I think the, the goal of any society that's striving to be utopic is to infuse as much knowledge as possible into every single person. Because really you can't have freedom without responsibility. And you can't be responsible if you don't have knowledge, right? So the, I would say the role of propaganda, it, if we're transitioning from an unawake society, which is where we are now, into an awakened society, well, what is that going to look like? And right now, um, there's a three-stage process. I don't know the exact names for the trivium, but it's called the trivium. There's three stages. And essentially, it's observation logic and discernment to recoin those three terms so in order to actually gain understanding you have to have that middle step you've got to observe so you got somebody's got to tell you some information and then you've got to take those pieces and say well what does this mean what can i understand from this and then at the end of that you're going to get a conclusion you're going to get a meaning something that you can walk away with and say oh well if I want to cook scrambled eggs and I have to take two eggs and I have to do this, and this is the reason why, and at the end of that, you're going to have a skill. You're actually going to be empowered. Well, propaganda, it ties to take that middle step out. And what it does is it gives you the information, but it's in a prepackaged belief system, you know, that, well, this is what this means. That's the only meaning. And if you don't believe this, then you're crazy or conspiracy theorist, et cetera, et cetera. And really that's, the propaganda, how it's been used uh, up until this time is a way to, to shape the reality of people so that when they're in a certain situation, they'll react a certain way. Okay. I, I'm not sure what the author was going for in the book, but I would say to use the tool of propaganda, what we're talking about is we'd have to infuse that middle step back into it. And really, it, just to completely remove the term because it's got so much bias on it, let's just talk about sharing information. And that's essentially what I feel like a society would need to do is not just infuse knowledge in every person, but also make knowledge readily available to everybody and not place any social 
constraints on differences of opinion. And right now that's the total polar opposite where we're in. You know, if you're, we're extremely polarized, where if you're pro this, then you must be anti that. <laughs> and, you know, it, and there's really only two boxes you can be in. It's either this one or that one. But in reality, there's, as we were mentioning earlier, there's a huge amount of diversity. So we've really got to get away from the guru, expert, authority style society where we're we're dependent on somebody else to tell us what's real we're dependent on somebody else to tell us what is healthy or what is right or wrong and rediscover those things inside of ourselves so what i'm i'm hearing is we almost have to come back to personal homeschooling for ourselves pretty much that right yeah. we have to go to school on an one-on-one -on -one with ourselves and uh examine research and redefine freedom and what is really propaganda so that we can identify it in the world and actually i would think a utopic version of if propaganda was something that we needed to be educated about i would imagine we'd have to attach transparency to it yes. so now if a commercial product is being promoted they'd have to honestly say, you know what, we're trying to meet a certain quota of funding. So we are using this appeal uh, to get your attention. And yes, we're talking directly to the 13 to 20 year of age. And you lay all the stuff out on the table, right? I mean, just imagine if everything was transparent. So propaganda is, uh, we'd be educated to be able to identify it and start to heal it in ourselves too. Like when, when we're being propagandized, right? Mama. Uh, you know, when you get, what, what's the word? Dogma. Propaganda. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we get on our high pedestal, right? Yeah. You know, we're just being all charismatic and we dress it all up and it's like the motivation isn't really uh, apparent, but you're really trying to win the people over with this idea. So I mean, Becomes, we could turn, I was just gonna what'd you say? Then the then the conversation becomes so blue. I the right now is to make a suggestion to get you to have a completely different belief system so that the funding that I want to put towards legalizing cannabis can actually happen. So may I make a suggestion that's very full of propaganda and can you possibly allow me to brainwash you? Well, maybe, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's kind of like I'd be saying, okay, you got the platform. Totally. Put like, on the show. You reign to be as robust as you need to be, and my freedom to discern will play at some point. But I am aware that you're going to use propaganda at this moment to try and convince me to change my belief systems. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you could have more transparent conversations about why are you using propaganda? Why are you trying to suggest this on me? Uh, what in me are you trying to change my mind, my opinion? I mean, then we bring all this to the surface. Right. So it's you know, why? Right. It seems like his idea of propaganda, you know, when you were first speaking of it, <clears throat> is almost like he's saying we need something to continue to exercise our discernment. We need something to continue to work out our brain, our intellect. So propaganda is needed in the sense that if we don't have any of that ever, then it's like God wouldn't exist if humans didn't exist because we're constantly questioning that existence of the divine. So, you know, the truth wouldn't exist if we couldn't exercise our, you know, our use of propaganda because then we would just stop truth seeking. And so our brains would go to mush, but <laughs> it, it serves a purpose in that way, I think. It's, but again, it's this utopic society of people who are awake that go, I know what that is. And that was great. That was a wonderful workout for my brain, but I know what's going on here. So right. you know, it's this idea of, of being awake enough to know what, what that, where that comes from and to be discerning in that. There's something else I wanted to touch on that you were saying, and I've lost it, but maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> So. Okay, so somewhere that ties into investigative reporting and being able to be discerning. It's like, we need to understand propaganda. It would be one of the things to educate ourselves about so that we could identify propaganda. 
Yeah, so what I was going to say, and this speaks to the article recently that you, you wrote, which was um, about, you know, artificial intelligence and how there's this, you know, whether it's propaganda or ultimate truth around, you know, nanotechnology and chemtrails and how we're being inserted with, you know, artificial intelligence from wherever it may be. But I take it a step back and I go, dude, you're on your iPhone seven hours a day being spoon fed how to make those eggs or how to call and get them delivered. All you have to do is press one button. It'll call for you and the eggs will show up scrambled at your door. <laughs> so this idea that really struck me in your most recent article is about self-mastery. So regardless of whether we're implanted with artificial intelligence or it's coming through our chemtrails, it's already happening because we've become passive in our own learning. Right. Um, so, you know, we don't even know how to look at maps anymore. And so this idea of, if you take away our self mastery, if you take away that middle step and insert it with propaganda and spoon feeding us, and that's, that can happen on such a simple level as, you know, using your GPS system all the time or Googling a recipe and having it walk you through it as opposed to experimenting and problem solving. So, you know, this idea that it's all this big stuff that's going to hit us in the future is like people are so dumbed down right now. We're using artificial intelligence in the palm of our hand and thinking, oh, that's never going to happen to us as a society because we'll know better. And it's not the, you know, and it's all conspiracy theory that it's the government or it's aliens or it's, the, but you know what? You have your iPhone right in front of you all day long. Right. You're doing it to yourself as a society. We are getting less and less awake every moment of every day by using this artificial art smart. I mean, it's called a smartphone for a reason. It's, it's smart and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love for you hey, to just a question. Is it, is it just me dropping out or is it all of us? Uh, no, just you, I think. Yeah, I think just oh, okay. me. I mean, we dropped out earlier. Okay. I might be getting to the end of my bandwidth is why it's, uh, it's probably tech. Okay, sorry about that. Yes. Our, um, I was asking a conversation to kind of um, bubble up around artificial intelligence and the dumbing down of ourselves, you know, now as opposed to when AI is going to be implanted in us and um, this idea of self-mastery and how I guess propaganda is that place that's inserting itself into that middle place where we should be actually cogitating and working through things and, it, and we're not we're actually just handing it over to artificial intelligence already so i'd love for our, for you two to speak to that maybe well i think that it goes right back to what you stated earlier which is the instant gratification <clears throat> we're so we're so focused on the emotional part of our lives yeah. and it's only one aspect um but as we focus on that that instant gratification is is like a uh it's normal for that to, to come into play after being shown, you know, all the propaganda. And one point, at one point in our societies, we didn't have the kind of propaganda that we do have now. There was a time when there was a commercial about a car, for instance, and it gave you the statistics, they gave you all the, the pertinent information, all, you know, the horsepower, how long does, you know, how long, how fast does it go? How, how many miles per gallons does it get? Things like this. But then there was a point around World War II where, the, where it all switched and it became more, you know, trying to manipulate society, um, not just for profit, but also for manipulation, uh, for, for control by the government uh, for nefarious uh, <laughs> purposes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's speak to that because this idea that, you know, if you buy this car, it has this horsepower, it gets this gas mileage, has this rust, you know, proofing on it. And now you watch it, as they're half naked driving on little seats, and you go, what the hell did, I don't even know what it was an advertisement for. So it feeds exactly. like that is very primitive. And so it's almost like if we get into this idea of propaganda and what, as a society, they're trying to dumb us down and mold us towards, it's their, this primitive place of ourselves. Yeah. Um, I would love for to speak to that. Based on your research around artificial intelligence, propaganda, manipulation, um, the need, and how they're entraining us to have these really emotional needs and wants. We, we have no discernment. We just blindly go out and go after it because it incites something in our fat cells or our, you know, our starvation cells that needs to be fed. What, right. what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, uh, I mean, 
To answer the question of AI, we have to understand what the mind is. And um, I'm pulling from natural law research that I've studied for years. This is from the blog post we did. This Are is. Talk about it's, this? I didn't mention this specifically in the blog post, but it, I, the same theme is in there. And it's the idea of uh, what basically, how do we become self mastered beings? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, very simply, that if we're not self mastered, we're dependent on something else. It's a binary kind of choice. There's not too many things in, in reality that are binary, but that's one of them. And what I mean by binary, it means it's black and white. You're either mastering yourself or somebody else is your master. Okay. Yes. And the phrase that I like to say is you either use your mind or somebody else uses it for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so in really in order to understand what, why AI can take over and why anything can take over externally, it, we have to understand what our role is and we're powerful beings, you know, we, out of all the species on the planet, we have the greatest capacity to understand, from our present day understanding anyway, and not to discount other animals being intelligent, but um, we are extremely powerful. The choices that we make have huge effects on the world around us. So basically what it comes down to is the two aspects of, of mind within ourselves, which is the principle of gender in natural law. So in the principle of gender, you have the feminine, the masculine aspect. The unconscious mind is the feminine aspect. That's what's all of the information, you may have heard this in psychology or something on the science channel where even if you're not paying attention to something, all the data that's in your experience is actually being received by your unconscious. It's always being your stored. Feminine aspect. Your feminine aspect. Okay, and then there's the conscious mind. That's what you, you consciously think about. That's what you choose to focus your attention on. Exactly. So to see how this plays out, if you take anything, any object, experience, whatever, it's all symbolic in the sense that when it's in your focus, when it's in your attention, now whatever, what you have experienced in the past if in your unconscious is gonna come bubbling up to the surface. And now the two literally fuse, they have, and a new thought is born, a new idea is born, okay? Well, when our conscious mind isn't working that well, when we don't really consciously pay attention to our, our inner thoughts, and we're only using the eyes of the flesh to see outside of us, then it means that it's like we're ignoring a whole part of ourselves that's, that's inside. And so we can be subtly conditioned from the outside world that goes right, it by, bypasses right through the conscious mind into the unconscious. And now we have, we're reactory instead of critically thinking, okay? So to use the commercial example, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who's very unconscious, you're not focusing too much on your own internal process, you don't really have a lot of discernment, you're gonna be manipulated by your emotions very easily. And, it, the reason why the commercials are the way they are is because there's certain archetypes, sexuality is one of them. And we were just having a discussion with a friend of ours and he mentioned that the most advertising has become heavily sexualized. It's like a fetish almost. Mm -hmm. So when you see this car commercial, it's like there's this beautiful woman and the car is driving down the road and it looks all artsy and everything. And, and you're not even really sure what you, you just watched but you feel really good about thinking about a new car, <laughs> you know? So there is something that was triggered there. Did we, did we lag out? No, you're good. Hopefully I'm back. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm still here. I had to shut my video off to tax my bandwidth okay. less. Okay. So you're gotcha. still, we're all still here. Um, Am I able to come through? Yes. You're good. Looks like we cut out. Oh, I'm good. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I can still hear so, all of you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so, um, so really the basis of all external control, whether it's an AI, whether it's a tyrannical leader, whether it's subtle mind control or sub subliminal messages, 
all of it has to bypass your conscious mind because it's your conscious mind that is trying to make sense of your experience. Okay. So if you, if you're underdeveloped in your conscious mind, your mat, and that's the masculine aspect. Okay. Then your feminine aspect has, is left open to be basically brutalized by somebody else's mask. Mm -hmm. There we go. I think okay, we Rebecca, can you hear me? I can. Uh, did we just lose Justin and Julian? I can we're see. back. Okay. Okay. Really interesting that we're talking about subversive manipulation and AI and all of a sudden everything's going like wonky. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually going back to wondering if the word propaganda wasn't the trigger point. Could be. But yeah. And okay. So Loving this conversation though. Yeah, continue with your thoughts, Justin. Sure. So, um, so just to recap, so we have the, the mind. The mind has two, two aspects. It has the unconscious and the conscious. Now, your unconsciousness is just going to receive. It's like a recorder. It's not going to really try to make sense of anything. It's just going to receive the information. That's your feminine aspect. Your masculine aspect, the conscious mind, that's what's going to take the pieces and try to weave them into some kind of understanding, some meaning. All right? So what has happened in society is that they basically tried to get rid of the masculine aspect and replace it and replace it with an external government. source. Okay. And this is government. This is a monarchy, an external monarchy, a ruler. Somebody that's going to tell you what's real, how to live your life, how to do everything. Morality, what's right and wrong. Right. All this. So if you don't have a developed masculine aspect it, in harmony with your feminine aspect it's not that you're replacing one for the other they have to work together then you have no process of discerning all you have is the emotions that you come that are left with you okay and this is really the the foundation behind mind control ai manipulation everything is to try to get you to feel emotionally spun up in this huge storm of emotion and normally there'd be the masculine aspect that would come or the conscious mind and say, well, calm down, breathe. Let's take these pieces and try to make sense of everything. The stillness in the storm. The stillness in the storm, right, exactly. So, um, <laughs> so that's the way most of these programs work. All mind control is based on you accepting something to be true without actually knowing it to be true yourself. Okay, that's the basis of all mind control, whether it's propaganda, whether it's trauma based mind control, a really nasty form of mind control, whether it's AI manipulation, it's all to try to get your free will and your masculine aspect to walk away. And that way, the feminine aspect is left there helpless. And this is this is actually symbolically depicted in a huge number of places. If you do a Google search for the Columbia logo, it's the woman, she's standing there with the lamplight right okay well columbia that the term columbia refers to the dove or the feminine aspect in occultism and she's there is no masculine aspect there as a matter of fact she's looking for her masculine aspect because she's holding up a lamplight she's trying to guide the masculine aspect back to her okay and that's kind of the sim symbol that's being described it's, it's also revealed in Masonic symbolism and tracing boards where you have the feminine who's standing in front of her broken pillar and there's the death behind her with the scythe and she's reading and she's got the lamplight and she's kind of, she's sitting there waiting for us to basically wake up and stop being dependent on somebody else. So when we think about this idea of AI control, it's really the same concept. The AI needs our technology, you know, and maybe this may sound like a foreign concept to some people, but the most uh, intelligent and amazing computer that has ever existed is our human minds and our brains, right? So the artificial intelligence, it has no way to intuit. It doesn't have an intuition. It doesn't have a creative aspect. All it can do is use the rigid framework of its programming and logic to follow a certain course. And so because it can't really invent anything new, because it can't innovate, 
it requires us to do that for it. And what it uses is it does it with all sorts of easy fix answers. Well, you know, you need to get to your, the, you know, somewhere down the road. Don't learn the way by yourself. Don't look at a map and try to figure out how to do it yourself. Just grab the GPS and you're on the way, you know, or, um, or whatever. I mean, there's countless examples we can look at where we're, we're con continually placing more and more dependence on technology uh, and not learning internally ourselves. I mean, I admit I'm a horrible speller. If it wasn't for spell check, I'd be in a really bad place. <laughs> um, so, but that's one example of how technology can be used as a tool, but where it becomes a problem is where we stop growing inside of ourselves because we got an easy fix for us. Right. Okay. And when, when the reason we titled the post self mastery and discernment are essential to avoid AI enslavement is because the, the artificial intelligence program is, has already taken over. It's already happened. Um, a really good researcher to look at is Harold Kreutz Vela. He studies Morgellons and self-replicating nanotechnology. This, this, these self-replicating machines have been sprayed on the planet for at least the past 20 years. Okay, and arguably many of the, the entities that the elite have contacted in the thousands of years in the past to try to get more and more draconian programs in place, they're most likely contacting artificial intelligence. So by taking up our own internal mastery, by actually asking us the que ourselves the questions, well, why is something true? Not just blindly accepting, well, this is what the authority said, this is what the scientist said, this is what the doctor said. Now we can know why ourselves. And that's, that's really, it's crucial to know the answers or, or know why something <coughs> works ourselves. And initially, it's, it's going to feel unsettling, like you were saying. It's going to be chaotic because the truth is, is we don't know. <laughs> You're, I don't care who you are, but most nobody has gone to go do something that they want to do, and immediately it's been absolute perfection. There's always a learning process. There's always an acclimation process. And we shouldn't fear that. We should embrace that. That's like the mystery of existence in a sense. So when we're really able to, to embrace the storm of the unknown and the mystery and bring that into ourselves and make sense of it and continue to purify it like a feedback or a torus, then eventually we're gonna to start to have a really good foundation internally in ourselves. And it'll get to the point where the most elaborate deception will can't even touch us because we've just got such amazing discernment. <clears throat> I think we, um, I just wanted to mention to whoever may be listening that um, we went into really great detail about what we just, about what Justin just stated. We talked about not only in the self mastery <clears throat> and discernment post, but also the um, organic versus artificial immortality, which is in a sense the end goal of artificial intelligence uh, being to continue just like life. Uh, just as life uh, wishes to continue, artificial life also wants to continue, and we go into much greater. Uh, we went into much greater detail and linked some um, soft disclosure, if you will, that is given to us in the form of a story. Um, you know, through movies, as many may know, a lot of information is disclosed that way, and many movies have talked about artificial intelligence about um you know this black goo that uh harold has been talking about um look at spider-man 3 and venom who comes from outer space and he's this black goo that takes over you know takes over the human body and now <clears throat> it's performing all these incredible feats they're more powerful they have all these abilities and so Check, you know, I suggest you look at the post and check out the two videos that we linked in there because it really helps, you know, put that into focus and uh, it may help you see what it is that we're talking about. There was also another show. It was like four seasons and I forget the name of it, but um, it was about this um, sci br brilliant team of scientists that found a way to wipe out the power grid of the whole entire world. Do you know that show? Uh, no. I 
for the show is I'll have to think of the name of it and post it on the Facebook page. But the I the like the emblem for the show was um like the circle with the line through it for the power for a computer. Uh, and it gets pressed and it goes zzz, zzz. but by the four by the second season they start introducing AI as part of the understory for it. And it's if anyone's interested in looking at how it's starting to show up in the media in these ways, it's actually really informative to watch all four seasons to really see where this, and I'm not gonna spoil it for anybody, and I will get the name up on our Facebook page, um, to see where AI can really go and how subtle it is at first and where we are now. And if you watch all four seasons, to see where it can go very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I just have a couple- Well, this, this brings, this brings back the topic of conscious dying because I'm sitting here going, okay. And I imagine many people are, what's the creative solution to this? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's to empower the observer. Mm -hmm. And so when we focus on conscious dying, which is essentially a letting go process, then we're really watching our minds, you know, we really want to observe all the programs in our head and, and really develop that intuitive, which is why I think we're turning our attention towards the mother, towards the earth, is what is it, what is the experience of being organic, organically connected? And it brings us back to the sensations in our bodies and that intuitive, the feminine. But the conscious dying might be one of our, one of the upcoming practices that could serve us the best. Certainly. Yeah. Um, well, can I, can I just have you describe what would be conscious dying? Um, Okay, well, I'm, I, I do accept some of the influence of some of the Buddhist teachings, especially uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and a recent one I read, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And basically, it's saying, it's saying, put your focus on experiencing what is actually the nature of mind. So your observer really has to step back and watch, just like what you described, Justin, become more keen on when there are thoughts in your head that if you really watch them, you would pause and go, wait a minute, I don't think like that. Mm -hmm. Or there you are in your creative mode and you have a very passionate impulse that you feel from your body. And then immediately the program comes in and it would be something like doubt. Yeah. Okay. You, you start to become self-incriminating. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not confident enough and da, da, da. And it's like, you step back and go, where did that come from? And why would that self-incriminating thought even exist? Mm -hmm. So conscious dying is being able to observe to the point that you would begin to feel the impulse to have a thought and you take a deep breath and you don't allow the impulse to turn into a thought. Mm. You actually let, you breathe it, let it go, and drop back into perhaps the uh, feminine, perhaps the unconscious, perhaps your intuitive. Does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I think, um, you know, to, to get into a little philosophy here, you know, what is death really? And in a, in a mental sense or in a spiritual sense, I'd say when that which we've come to understand no longer serves us and expands and grows, we've, that's death. But anytime there's a death, there's always a rebirth. So, and really when we talk about death, we're not talking about the the mainstream version of it where once you were alive and now you're dead and there's no coming back it's it's more of a phoenix type of a situation where that which once was is re being reborn into something more grand and unified than it ever was before you know and and really yeah it's like you can look at like everything we're talking about or that example i gave you with the friend 
when I realized we were from two very diverse perspectives and I just had to breathe, that was That's a conscious death. I did not choose a position. I did not choose a right or a wrong. I allowed it to just be what it was. And by me not attaching a thought to it, it was a conscious death while still not experiencing a physical death. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That, and that's so um, okay. Rebecca had shared, I think, uh, last week on Get Lit, which I thought was pretty profound. Uh, you ended up in a Buddhist workshop. A friend encouraged you to come on, let's go. You didn't know what the theme was. And once you got there, the topic was conscious dying. It was about death. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the Buddhist monk shared is that there was a uh, global um, message going out within that monastic lifestyle of it is time to focus on teaching the people how to die. Right. And I think I think that that, you know, I had written an article and we've we've talked about this for five weeks now on, you know, giving our attention to conscious dying is going to give us the spaciousness to allow diversity. Mm -hmm. When we stop compartmentalizing and stop attaching judgment, we essentially are letting things die. Right. And I think that's our, uh, our opening into we could begin to really recognize AI programming if we started to take more of that backseat observer self and let all those programmings, which are simply the mental hamster wheels in our head that are usually negative, you know. No, you can't be a leader. You can't voice this, uh, you know, and you doubt yourself. All those things are not organic to the high spiritual beings that we are. And at this point on the planet, everybody takes it personally. We self-incriminate all the time, which is keeping us dumbed down. Right. And we're spending so much time reacting to the stupid negativity of a program. But if we start to recognize absolutely every iota of negativity in our head is AI and start to allow it to die, I think that would also indicate that we are no longer feeding it either. Mm -hmm. And if we want to even get away from the word AI to make it a bit more globally accepted, we could just call it propaganda. You know, every negative thought we have has been conditioned in us through propaganda, through media, through all of, you know, it, we're bombarded. And one statistic showed that um, an average, a child on average 20 years ago saw about 500 advertisements a day. And now it's 5,000. And out of those 500, maybe 20% slightly sexualized. Now out of the 5,000 a child sees, that what we talked about, that feeding that emotional place <clears throat> is probably out of those 5,000, maybe 90% are sexualized or emotionalized mm -hmm. or you know desirous and need-based in ways where it triggers our primitive brainstem to just you know wire our brains in such a way that by the time we actually get to a place of waking up and going, this might not actually be right. We have to work so much harder to get our brains back to square one and rewire them. But also this okay, so just then you're addressing education, Becca. Well, yeah, you're, you're bringing back education of why we would want to understand propaganda yes. and why, and why we would understand suggestibility that that's the education we need to bring forward. But I'm also bringing it back to a place where it's not even, when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and people go, oh, that's out there, that's over there, that's some sci-fi, it's not. It's, it's anything that is conditioning us and manipulating us to change and dumb down the way we think. It's conditioning us to be subservient and to mold us in such a way that we become passive. Exactly. So whether it's actual technically AI or, <laughs> as Justin spoke to, any form of something that manipulates us into wiring our brains in such a way to be passive, not use our 
brains to problem solve, <laughs> be awake to continue on our path. So I just wanted to point that out, or at least reframe for those of us that don't know a lot about AI or that research that we're really talking about an entire century of an increasing amount of manipulation being shoved at us to reconfigure and mold how it is that we they want government money spenders anything wants us to think and do in such a way so yes but i am talking essentially about education and you know this idea that we need to get children on the ground rolling around and really wrestling with creating a brain that um is just and understands what freedom means in a way where it's the greater good of all but we're not going to do that with the systems we have in place we're just going to create more brains that are wired exactly like the brain sitting next to them and wired exactly like the brain sitting next to them because everybody is getting the same propaganda condition into them without even knowing it right so i, I could go on about that whole thing but no totally i mean to demystify the whole AI concept. Basically, very simply put, if you aren't personally making your own choices and decisions based off of a rational, logical process, then you are being controlled by somebody else. Whether it's your friend and neighbor, whether it's your lover, whether it's the cabal or an artificial intelligence or an ET or extra dimensional entity. I mean, ultimately, it, they're all the same same common issue is you are not personally in control of your own discernment. Well, what would be the definition of intelligence? Intelligence? Yeah. The way Mark Passio described it, where he talks about inner generation, right? Inner generate, right, yeah. <clears throat> so if, if that's it, basically, because it's either intelligence or artificial intelligence. So if, you're, if, you're, if uh, all your decision making is coming from outside somewhere else, some government agency, some um, you know, some high figure in your life. Um, if you're not understanding how to make those decisions and just being told, uh, being told what to do, not how to do, then you're in artificial right. intelligence. You're not generating your own, you're not using your intellect to generate things, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think that our education system is setting our children's wiring up so that when they get to the age of being decision makers and spenders and um that you know the, the way our system is set up educationally we're just creating brains that are needing to rely on other things to make decisions for them and right. so whether it's the teacher the curriculum the parent the media that they sit in front of there's this really subtle or obvious to some of us ways in which we're wiring the brain of people as they develop so that they're primed and ready to be manip manip manipulated at some point when they're they're of the age of having freedom or decision making abilities and things like that. Right. Right. We're looking for an authority or an expert. Again, <clears throat> like we talked about or how you spoke about earlier, our our masculine aspect has been hijacked. And so we have to our minds need it it still has to actually work that way because that's the way we do and so our in our minds we replace it with our own um and we replace it with uh, excuse me with an outside force like you said like a teacher like a you know principal a president a monarch a proxy an agent an in intermediary <laughs> right and we talked about this in so actually the, 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 the male like okay. then the male role at this point might be its most beneficial position is to encourage the feminine. Like if we, if we kept focusing, cause that would be the conscious mind, the conscious mind that's deciding let's nurture the feminine, let's nurture intuition, let's nurture the mother. That would be a way to heal the male. Right. It would give the male a conscious role. Right. And that's it's why kind of going back, it would return to the male revering the female. Right. A true union, not a patriot. Right. And so, yeah. Right. And so then our conscious mind wouldn't just be uh, vacant. Like that's how we, we can reprogram the use of our conscious mind is to turn our attention to the feminine. 
Right. And, and really that reprogram, that's a great way to phrase it because ultimately we're all heavily programmed in life. Um, whether it's from the media, from our parents, from school and education. I mean, it's all about conditioning and programming the unconsciousness, the feminine aspects. So all of the work that the cabal does to put it in this, these terms, it's all doing being done to the feminine aspect of ourselves, the unconscious. And this happens, the only way for this process to actually start is if they brutalize and traumatize the masculine aspect. So, you know, using the educational system that we have right now, it's all outcome-based. In other words, it's all a social form of trauma. Your teacher says that you need to understand it this way. And if you have your own unique perspective or understanding, well, that clearly must be wrong. And not only is it wrong, but you're an idiot, incompetent and incapable. So get your act together and fall in line. You know, and that's basically, that's the meme that everybody gets programmed with as soon as they get in school, whether it's you wanting to go to the bathroom when it's not bathroom time or you having a different perspective on an art piece or writing a paragraph in a way that your teacher doesn't think is justifiable. It's all the way it actually conditions and, and process that it has on the person is to make, to subvert their own internal process and bow down and accept the external process. Okay. So there you have your negative program, your negative hamster wheel. Now right. let's say, we gave the masculine, the honorable aspects of you. Uh, we've always seemed to uh, have an affinity towards the masculine is a protector. Mm -hmm. So let's say those negative thoughts come into our head and we call on, I want my masculine protector here right now to say that the mother, the feminine should only be honored, respected, loved. And so if self-doubt comes in, our masculine healer says, no, 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 no. There's no self-doubt here. Right. Or uh, second guessing, the masculine comes in and goes, I'm sorry, but there's no second guessing when it comes to the feminine. And if we could uh, cre create our own archetype of the masculine healer and let that consume our mind that's protecting the mother, protecting the divine feminine, we could really reprogram ourselves right back into the core of the earth. And that, yes, exactly. I mean, I think that's really it. And this is, the, for me in my process of deprogramming, it's being willing to accept even the darkest, horrific parts of myself that come up to the surface, you know, or the mistakes that I make or my inadequacy. I mean, anything, anything that is related to me in my experience I have to accept that. I have to love it just as, a, and as an immediate, like that's what initiates the process because as soon as right. you start trying to cherry pick things about yourself, well, you know, I like this, but I don't like that. So I'm just going to ignore this part of myself. Mm -hmm. I don't like that anymore. Well, what you would deny yeah. about yourself internally manifests outside of you as fate. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, so really okay. it, my process of reprogramming is first you got to observe, you got to realize that you are programmed and what is yeah. the program actually doing? And then secondly, like you were, the breath process is huge for me. Anytime I feel myself beginning to react and go into this kind of inertia of my past programming, I just try to breathe, take a really nice deep breath, let it all completely out and just observe right. for a moment. And then with right. from that space, now I can usually, you know, bring in my conscious and my feminine and, and try to rework and discern. And, that, and that's what brings us full circle to self-love, uh, nurturing ourselves. And as the mother, accepting us for all of who we are. We have, uh, we're time, uh, our time is up, dear ones. Uh, so we need to bring this to uh, a closure. And it's just been, I just love where we've ended up and have really enjoyed this conversation. I could totally go on and on with each of you. Um, but perhaps if there's any parting words that you'd like to share, and then we'll let, uh, <laughs> let this take us out. Um, <clears throat> again, thank you guys for the opportunity. It was a wonderful conversation. 
Um, some of the, I wanted to just share again, some of the titles of the blog posts um, of uh, where the ideas that we spoke of kind of have also been shared. Um, obviously it was a self mastery and discernment. Uh, we also had the divine feminine in distress. She's waiting for your divine masculine. Thank you. Uh, mm. We also uh, we just released yesterday a really in depth, I, at least I think, really in depth, uh, good one <laughs> called um, "Organic versus Artificial Immortality." Uh, so those three, I think, are really good. Uh, also, order following with Mark Passio. Mark Passio is an excellent source. If you've never heard of him or never watched any of his videos, I highly suggest that you that you uh, educate yourself with some of his uh, information because he does a really good job of breaking it down to archetypes. So <clears throat> that's all I have for now. Okay. Um, I'll just throw one more article that I, I felt like we really kind of covered a lot of bases is uh, the natural law basis of harvest. Um, just do a Google search for that. We get into a lot of different ideas in there and um, I just want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to, to discuss all the, the things we've been talking about today. It's something that we're really passionate about. And, and um, I'll just end it with we, Julian and I were on the path of truth seeking. We're, on, we're trying to discover the truth, but we don't know mm -hmm. with absolute certainty what the ultimate truth is. I feel like we're all collectively working together to figure that out. So yeah. I'm really happy to yeah. engage in that process with all of you. Oh, thank you so much. And you know what I'd like is if you would send me all the links of the references you just stated, and I'll include them in the follow-up uh, website page. Yes, yeah, so we'll when the archive we'll when also, we have the archive Moody uh, movie uploaded. We'll Becca? also put them on our Facebook page as well. Get lit on Facebook, so you'll be able to see them there as well. Great. I want to say thank you for joining us today. It's been such a joy and such a pleasure, and I love that we came full circle around to having enough self love to love everything else in our, you know, and that's what leads to discernment. So mm -hmm. I just, I was, I loved everything you guys brought to the table today. Can't wait to have you on again. Thank you yeah, for um, making this happen for us. So I am going to sign off and say goodbye and let dear Roman close and we'll go from there. All right. And yeah, it's been beautiful. Absolute honor. And I would love to have you guys back on again. Uh, I hopefully I'll have better internet access so I can really stay up on your articles, but I, I fully recommend people want to, uh, hear some really good investigative reporting. Look these guys up stillness in the storm and follow their articles. And they're all over Facebook too. You can go to, you can find them there as well. And again, I want to, um, all our listeners, thank you so much for being present. And we always welcome any feedback on our Get Lit page on Facebook. And again, anytime that you can make any kind of a donation, contribution to CCN, ConsciousConsumerNetwork.tv, we are always so grateful. Because remember, we don't accept corporate or government funding. And that's why we are an uncensored platform and we can bring you the authentic truth. So blessings to everyone out there. Thank you, Mel V and Biggie, for keeping this alive. We love you. Blessings. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. If you really had to make a difference on a large scale with minimal resources, how would you go about it? Have you ever dared to dream? of doing that which seems impossible. On a planet steeped with corruption and destruction, the question beckons, how do we change it? Media has a far-reaching impact on people and has been used to manipulate humanity into our current destructive patterns. In order to affect people into moving into constructive patterns of behavior, we need to construct a new paradigm of media. with the explicit intention of giving the amazing truth-seeking, solutions-orientated, alternative media a place to fully realize their true potential with a cutting-edge, 
high-tech professional media platform. In turn, some of the greatest freedom-seeking hearts and souls of our time have realized the true potential of what has been created and have come together to provide their insight and inspiration on CCN. Conscious Consumer Network has become a unique, interactive information and educational network which provides a free-to-view, live-stream, ultra-high-definition channel to the world and features 25 live shows a week and growing with the addition of multiple language broadcasts. CCN has features comparable with mainstream media such as being able to pause and rewind broadcasts whilst being live-streamed. Catch up on missed or previous broadcasts now available from the CCN High Definition Downloads. You can now purchase a high definition download of your favorite CCN show from ethymarket.com. Support free and independent media by becoming a monthly pledger. This can be done with a monthly pledge of 10 euros, which will allow you unlimited access to CCN's high definition downloads which hosts a back catalogue of over 250 shows which have been aired since the launch of CCN on the 1st of January 2015. In order to keep CCN on the air, public funding is needed. Please donate to CCN's Network Support Fund or become a monthly pledger. Help keep alternative media in the hands of the people. We thank you for supporting free and independent media.